The Great Little Madison by Jean Fritz. James Madison was a small, pale, sickly boy with a weak voice. If he tried to shout, the shout shriveled up in his throat. But of course, he was still young. His voice might grow as he did, or he might never need a big voice. So far, he got along fine on his father's Virginia plantation, where nothing much changed. But the weather, and the seasons, and the coming of babies. There would be twelve babies in the Madison family. Before they quit coming, five died young. James, or Jamie, as his father called him, was the oldest, and if he was like his father and his grandfather before him, he'd spend his life on this land, bounded in the west by the lovely blue line of mountains that seemed to mark the end of the world. In 1760, when nine-year-old James helped his father move the furniture from their old house to the new brick one that looked square at the mountains, James understood that this house and the five thousand acres that went with it would one day belong to him. James loved this place, practically the trees, the groves of walnuts where he played with his brothers and sisters and the black children who belonged to the plantation. The two tulip trees that were so much alike, they were called the twins, and his favorite, the red buds that turned themselves into pink froth every springtime. Still, he knew there was more to the world than his father's 5,000 acres, more than was contained in his own orange country or in Virginia itself. At nine, he was reading, and although he had always asked questions of his own, where do the redbirds fly in winter? He was discovering in his father's library questions he would never have thought of asking. His father had 85 books, and by the time he was 11, James had read them all. They had titles like The Duty of Man, The Employment of Microscope. There was one on cold bathing, one on children's diseases. He may have been especially interested in the, the diseases, for he was sick a great deal. All his life, he suffered from fever, bellious attacks, liver upsets, and from occasional seizures in which for a few moments he would stiffen and lose control of his mind. A doctor diagnosed this as a form of epilepsy caused by nerves. But James simply called it a falling sickness. In any case, sickness didn't often keep him from reading. Nothing ever would. But here, he was 11 year old, and there was not an other book in the house to read. So Mr. Madison sent him off to a school in a neighborhood co country where he had all the books he wanted. He learned French so he could read books that were written in French, and he learned Latin and Greek 
so he could find out what men thought hundreds of years ago. He studied geometry and algebra and the history of other nations. And to show just how much bigger his nation of the world had become, he drew a picture of the university in his copybook. All the planets were there and the sun, a big round circle in the center. Then, in order to give his universe a more friendly look, he gave the sun a face, eyes, nose, and a mouth that was almost ready to smile. But best of all, however, was his teacher, Mr. Rob Robertson who raised all kinds of questions. Where were there people on those planets? And made his pupils use logic and reasoning when they spoke. He couldn't make James speak any louder, but he did make sure that when he did speak, he had something to say. James stayed at Mr. Robertson's school until he was 16 and would like to have stayed longer, but his father called him home. A name minister, Mr. Martin, was living with them now, and he could teach James along with the oldest of his brothers and sisters at the same time, he would prepare James to enter college, the College of New Jersey. Princeton was the place Mr. Madison and Mr. Martin picked. Most young men in Virginia attended the nearby college of William and Mary, but that wouldn't do for James. Too much drinking and partying at that school. Besides, the climate was not healthy. In the summer of 1769, when James was 18 years old, he set out on horseback for New Jersey, accompanied by Mr. Martin. He didn't look old enough to be going to college, although actually he was older than most. His face still had that young, unset, waiting look, and he was little at five feet six. He was shy. Only when he knew a person well did he speak of what was going on inside him. He did know Mr. Martin, so he would not have been afraid to show his excitement, particularly when they reached Philadelphia. He had known, of course, that Philadelphia was the biggest city in the country, but how could he have guessed that the bigness and the busyness, the importance of the city would give it such a throb of life. This was obviously where things were happening. This is, is where life was running at full tilt. In its own way, the college at Princeton was also exciting. People were asking questions that struck at the very core of life. What is government? What is man? Because James was ahead of the freshman class in his studies, he entered as a sophomore, and perhaps this was the happiest year of his college life. He made close friends, 
devoured books as if he couldn't get enough of them, and joined in student fun putting greasy feathers on the floor where fellow students would slip on them, sitting, setting off firecrackers in newcomers' rooms and eyeing girls through, through telescopes. And for the first time, James felt caught up in affairs that were affecting the whole country over the last five years. He had been concerned, as everyone was, about Great Britain's aggravating policy of slapping down taxes on the colonies. But at Princeton, he felt that he was reacting as part of an aroused body, as if he and his friends were the colonists. They approved of the fact that American merchants in protest over taxation had stopped buying goods from England. But in 1770, when the merchants of New York wrote to the merchants of Pennsylvania, suggesting that they break this agreement, the students were enraged. James Madison was one of many who marched into the campus, cheering as a copy of that New York letter was thrown into a bonfire. The college bells tolled throughout the demonstration as if they were grieving from the liberty of the country. Flushed with patriotism, James cheered as loud as he could. His cheer, cheer may not have amounted to much, but his whole heart was in it. James loved his Princeton years, so it is surprising that he wanted to finish them so quickly. He and a friend, Joe Ross, applied for and received permission to take their last two years in one year. What was the hurry? Perhaps James was trying to cut down expenses for his father. Perhaps he was worrying about his future. After all, he was at college to prepare himself for something, but what? He could not bear the idea of simply settling down on his father's plantation, which managed quite well without him. He wished he could find a life for himself that had nothing to do with slaves. He hated slavery, but the South was so deep into it, he didn't see how it could get out. The only way he could escape was to find a career of his own. He listened to his friends talk of their plans for the future. Most were choosing to be preachers or lawyers, but how could James be either? With his weak voice, how could he stand up in a pulpit and deliver a thundering sermon about the will of God? How could he speak out in a courtroom and convince a jury that he was right? Besides, he didn't want to. Perhaps he worked so hard because he needed to prove himself or forget himself. Perhaps, without realizing it, he was simply trying to overcome his littleness. It was a terrible schedule that he and Joe Ross 
set themselves. For the most part, James tried to get by with no more than five hours of sleep a night. He must have felt his, his body break under the strain, but he didn't give up. He finished his work in time to get his degree, but he wasn't at the graduation ceremony with his ten classmates. One of his college mates, Aaron Burr, received a prize for spelling all in his class, gave a speeches, but James was too sick to attend. Still sick or well, would James have tried to deliver a speech in that little voice of his? He was so sick, he couldn't make the trip home when college was over, so he stayed on, studying Hebrew and the theology under the guidance of the college president. Perhaps his father suspected that James was simply delaying his homecoming. In any case, in April 1772, he sent for him. Come home and teach the younger children, he wrote. James went. It was a hard, tiring week, long ride from Philadelphia. And when he finally arrived home, he, would, he must have been suddenly overwhelmed by what lay ahead. It was as if he'd been trapped into the slow motion of the season. Almost as if he'd never gone to college, never been excited by books, as everyone could see. James was not suffering from his usual sickness. He was going through a physical and emotional breakdown. Not even the flowering redbud trees could raise his spirit. He taught the children, but that only took a few hours a day, and he read but to what purpose? He tried studying law, but found it, like everything else, boring. And then one day, a letter came from a college friend. When the news that Joe Ross had died, now he had grief to add to his depression, and he must have asked himself if Joe had been suffering in the way he had. Perhaps this was the inevitable result of two years of grinding over work. In any case, James became obsessed with the idea that he, too, would die young. James's father sent him to Warm Springs, a health resort whose mineral waters were supposed to cure all kinds of illness. James drank gallons of water, but still he came home no better. His doctor advised more ex exercise. Go out and ride horseback, he said. And actually, this did seem to help. In the end, however, it was not anything that happened on the plantation. But what was happening in the country itself? that brought James back to life. I do not meddle in politics, 
He wrote once to a college friend, but when at Christmas, 1773, this friend wrote him about Boston's dumping British tea into Boston Harbor rather than paying tax on it. He was an, as excited as if he'd done the dumping himself. The following year, he was strong enough to take his brother William to Princeton, where he was inerting school. Of course, he had to go through Philadelphia, and his pulse quickened as it always did in the center of much of his life. This time, the city was at a pitch of excitement for the Contential Congress was meeting here with delegates from all 13 colonies, waving questions like flags, challenging the future. How much longer would America put up with Great Britain? Should the country be prepared for war? James Madison came away moved by the oneness of America. Separate colonies they might be, but here they were acting in union, striving for the right to govern themselves. Our right, he would have said, for James counted himself in the struggle. At about this time, September 1774, James brought 200 acres of his father's farm for himself. He needed to own land in his own right if he wanted to vote or hold office. In December, he and his father were both elected to the Orange County Committee of Safety, whose jobs was to see that the county was prepared to fight and to make sure that everyone in the county was loyal to America. Anyone who still stuck up for England was called a Tory and would be punished. James entered enthusiastically into the work of the common committee. He knew he could never be regular soldier because of his falling sickness, but he did become a member of the local militia. He was commissioned a colonial, and although on his first day of drill he fainted on the parade ground, this did not discourage him. In letters to his friends, he was soon bragging about his marksmanship. If he had to, he said, he could hit a man full in the face at the distance of 100 yards. As for Tories, or suspected Tories, no penalty was to serve for them. One man who showed disrespect for a committee member was teared, tarred, and feathered. And according to James, this was no more than he deserved. If other states didn't know what to do with their traitors, he said, just send them down to Orange County. His committee would take care of them. Shooting 
and tar and feathering may have given James an outlet for his passion, for independence, but of course what James was best at, and had always been best at, was reasoning in May 1776, when it was becoming clear that King George III was not going to back down, James Madison was elected to represent Orange County at a state convention in Williamsburg. On May 15th, the convention voted anonymously. James along with everyone else, to instruct the Virginia delegates at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia to purpose a declaration of independence. Six weeks later, independence was declared. James Madison was only 25 years old, and he might have thought that at last he had found his career, but he probably gave his own future 